Champions Mojo is part of the CG Sports Network. Welcome to the award-winning Champions Mojo, hosted by two world record-holding athletes and health, life, and leadership coaches. Be inspired as you listen to Conversations with Champions. And now, your hosts, Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast. And as usual, I am co-hosting with Maria Parker. Hello, Maria. Hey, Kelly. It's good to be here today. Great to see you. And before we give our guest an amazing introduction that he deserves, let's just say hi to Matt Biondi as he sits there. Hey, Matt. Hi, everybody. Hey, Matt. We're so glad to have you. Yes, yes. Thank you. So, Maria and Matt, what an exciting show for us today. Um, our special guest, as we said, is Matt Biondi. Matt is an 11-time Olympic medalist, 14-time world record holder, and Matt competed in the Summer Olympic Games in 1984, 1988, and 1992, winning eight gold, two silver, and one bronze medal. During his career, he set three individual world records in the 50-meter free and four in the 100-meter free. And at the 1988 Games in Seoul, he won five gold medals, setting world records in the 50-meter free and three relay events. Maria, can you tell us a little bit more about Matt? Sure, Kelly. Matt's a member of the International Swimming Hall of Fame and the United States Olympic Hall of Fame and is one of the greatest American swimmers of all time. Currently, Matt is working with the International Swimmers Alliance. He's always been a proponent of swimmers earning money and having a seat at the decision-making table for competitive swimming. 30 years after he retired from swimming, partly because of a lack of financial support, Matt is now banding swimmers together in order to negotiate fair pay. We're so glad to have you today, Matt. Welcome to Champions Mojo. Thank yes, you. Welcome. Proud to be yeah. here. Wonderful to have you. So, Matt, let's uh, let's start off right off the bat and tell us about the um, International Swimmers Alliance. Be happy to. Um, you know, I had a, many different experiences throughout my career. And the last few years, I got to say, were pretty challenging as far as negotiating um, post-college um, prize money events, appearances, and, and advertising. Um, I think our sport was so underdeveloped at that time, and so many things have changed since then. I was a teacher for 17 years, and about a year and a half ago, came back along with the Professional Swimming League to organize swimmers finally, to get, as you said, at the table, to express our, our voice and to share in some of the, the benefits and the show that are created from the Olympics and from world championships. That's great. I, I read a little bit about your history and there was an implication that you were sort of trying to be outspoken as, a, as when, when you were in, in your most famous you know, years as a swimmer but you got a little bit of the, I guess what right now we might call it the cancel culture that, that you got kind of pushed into a corner. Is that true? Yeah, I, I take some responsibility for the relationship I had with USA Swimming. Um, I was young, I was frustrated. There was really no avenue for communication. And so we, Tom and I, Tom Jager, who we sort of were tag teaming with our match races and, and doing appearances in Europe, um, we took to the media and of course the media loves controversy and you know antagonist relationships and, and so that's sort of where it ended and it's too bad because I think I'm a pretty good spokesman I think I have a, a solid message that benefits all kids and, and parents alike um, and we just lost out on a great opportunity because there was no relationship there um, so now moving forward with the Swimmers Alliance, I think I've really learned an important lesson is that you don't make progress unless there's some compromise and open discourse. And again, this is something that's going on in other Olympic sports and all other professional sports. And for some reason, swimming has just been left behind. And so there's a great need and void for it. And because of that, we're, we're finding some good success. What is your uh, ultimate vision for like the the perfect world, if you could, you know, wave a magic wand and, and see what you'd like to achieve, what would that be? Well, I think it's, it's threefold. Um, the first one would for swimmers to have greater autonomy over their schedule. So we're still in a situation where federations are banning swimmers from certain meets. 
um, FINA act, act, actually actively engaged in suppressing the first swimming league. And there's a lawsuit now that's pending about that. So swimmers should have a choice to be able to pursue a professional career. And if they want to go to a meet in Europe to be able to pay the bills, they should be able to do that. The other one is probably less than 4% of all the funds created by the IOC and FINA are trickling down to the athletes. And you start looking at some of the travel budgets of these administrators, and they're all going first class and they're staying in five-star hotels and 20 course catered meals. And so there's some real questions about the equitable distribution of the funds. And then I think the third thing is career transitions and healthcare programs, educating on retirement programs, so that these swimmers are able to take advantage of their talents down the road. Yeah, that's, that's, those would be awesome. So Maria and I were just um, talking before you got on and how, um, you know, one thing, and we said, should we mention this? But I, I really would love to get your, your opinion on it and, it and if it's even occurring. So one way that sports makes a lot of money is gambling, is betting. And so we were saying, you know, horse racing, boxing, where you can put your money and say, my money's on Caleb Dressel, my money's on Sarah Sostrom. You know, what are your thoughts on, on that? Do you think people being able to bet on swimmers and put the money in the swimmer's hands, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, when I, my sophomore year in Texas, a swimmer from USC won a 12 pack of beer because he, he's against a Sanford swimmer that I <laughs> have been and parents have been gambling unofficially for you know ever since athletics began and um i'm personally not a gambler so i you know i'll bet a nickel or five dollars on the super bowl that kind of thing um but you know if it's done fairly and um it could be a good source of revenue for the professional swimmers as well so yeah we, we just we were sort of talking about it last night in my family and I was talking about ISL and how, you know, exciting and beautiful it is and quick and, you know, how it's, you know, sort of, you know, making swimming really exciting and, and, and of course, constant rather than once every four years for us. And um, they said, well, that sounds like, you know, going to the racetrack. <laughs> and then we were like, well, if swimmers could, could take, could take control of the betting, that, 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 that might be a source of income. This is hard to, you know, where, what are other models that this works in other athletes, you know, like in the NBA, you know, or wherever, you know, what, what happens there that the, that the players are so well paid? Uh, well, the, the league has done a tremendous job of marketing the event. It's, it's an entertainment. Um, I certainly enjoy watching sports on television. And they've also included the athletes at the table. And again, I mentioned the revenue sharing in professional sports is 50-50. Wow. In swimming, yeah. it's 96 to the administration and 4% to the swimmers. So there's a huge discrepancy there. And the athletes have bought into it. And the two, the management and the owners and the athletes have worked together to build their base and to build their revenue. And so it's that partnership that has been really successful. And I think, you know, swimming is an amazing show. Um, it, it draws the majority of the attention, certainly the first week of the Olympics. Um, some statistics, you know, people would say as high as 15% of Olympic fans watch swimming first and foremost. And then you look at Tokyo's revenue going into 2020 was over 7 billion. So what's 15% of 7 billion? It's a large amount. Yeah, mm, yeah, for sure. So um, Matt, who is the leadership of the International Swimmers Alliance? Are you leading it? Or are you, or is it board led or how is, how, what is the leadership? I started solo a year and a half ago. So it was July, roughly of 2019. And I hit the road and I started to talk to swimmers um, using my teaching background and a short PowerPoint presentation. Um, I must have talked either over the phone with the quarantine in place um, or traveling before that with uh, probably over a thousand elite level swimmers. These are professional swimmers by being on the league or they have an individual top 20 time long course meters. So this isn't just a collection of swimmers. These are the best of the best. Um, 120 have now become members from 31 different countries. So we're well-established uh, across the globe. Um, 
once we hit 120, we had a meeting and it was that we had and elect the board to represent them on the board. Uh, we have two additional marketing positions and an attorney, and then myself makes the 10 members. Um, so I've been the solo manager um, up until this point, now that we have the board to help support. So Matt, what, what are some of the definitions that you would give to great leadership? Oh, that's a great question, Kelly. <laughs> I've admired those individuals who are examples in the pool. I think it's, it's, a, it's an obvious connection to your, your top performing athletes. But in addition to that, it's about your individual character. I think more importantly, what you share with your teammates in the bus and at the lunch table, um, how you're able to support them to perform to their best. Um, I've also admired those individuals who are well-spoken and who can make an impact on young people to inspire them to just reach out and do their best. Um, I still get fan mail and I got a letter from a woman who now has children. And she said that after hearing me talk that she as a girl decided to go out for the school play, something that she was afraid to do and something that all of us, I think, being up in, in front of others and speaking or dancing and she did it. And she's now has her, her daughters in dance and she just took the time to thank me. Nice. And so those, I think all those qualities um, are important in leadership. Did, did, you, yeah. did you have those qualities yourself or have you developed them that, uh, particularly? I mean, I, I like the point about sharing what you have with your teammates and making the others around you better, particularly, you know, being well-spoken is something that you can develop, but did, is that something you were conscious of as a, you know, as a young person? I know you are now, obviously, but as a school teacher, I'd probably have to give myself a C plus when it comes to leadership. <laughs> <laughs> the plus being now working with swimmers, um, the C part being I was shy. I was um, I didn't have a lot of self confidence socially, like with especially with girls. Um, I did well isolated and just focused, and I think a lot of people took that as being arrogant or selfish, but I really was afraid. I was afraid to talk to people and, and to have them not like me, I guess. Um, so I think my leadership role was as an athlete in the pool, but I lacked that personal touch outside of the pool. Um, others um, did a much better job of commanding and, and making people feel at ease. I mean, if you think about the tension that athletes have, we're going to a bus, we're on a bus ride together, there's uh, 30 of us, and we're on our way to define our fate in the world championships. You know, we're in our mid 20s, and we've been swimming all of our lives, and it comes down to less than a minute, they will be judged. And somebody to move around the bus and just make people feel light and laugh, and it's, it's huge. And I didn't really have that skill. Wow, that's so, it's so surprising to hear that you were, weren't comfortable, you know, necessarily confident in approaching women because I, I'm sure you have a ton of fans. I know Maria and I, you know, uh, said at the beginning of this, we were, we were huge fans. Um, so with your stardom, so we, we really, um, for, for younger listeners, and I'm sure, I know we have a wide range of listeners, everything from kids, young kids on their way to swim practice in carpool. We've had parents tell us they listen to Champions Mojo to, you know, 70-year-old master swimmers on their way to practice. So for those young kids that are not familiar with Matt Biondi and, and your legend, Matt, so it's like we said, if there was a Mount Rushmore of swimming, you would be on it. If, um, you know, between the names Mark Spitz and Michael Phelps for many of us, it was Matt Biondi. So this is a, a level of stardom that few swimmers really ever reach. And so do you have any interesting encounters or stories that, um, you know, that only happen at that real level? You, you know, you're still getting a fan mail. So that right there is, a, is an interesting story. But anything that kind of comes to mind, we, we love stories from our guests. Anything that comes to mind? Absolutely. Um, and you know, stardom actually started at five years old. 
And I think oh. I can identify these cycles in my life that were all really very similar. And for young people today, I would think about the connection between pain and pleasure. And what I mean by pain is in my first race when I was five, my swimsuit came off <laughs> and it went all the way down to my ankles. And I literally mooned the whole crowd in lane six with a stroke that had nothing to do with moving forward, but purely trying to get my suit back up where it belonged. I got past my knees. And when I turned around, the dads got up out of their lawn chairs and were giving me a standing elevation. I like this kid. <laughs> That's what I mean about pain, right? Just, I was, it was embarrassing. And then two months later, I set a record in the Meadow Mini Meet that lasted for over two decades. And so for young people today, we all experience setbacks. And it's just such a natural part of achievement. And I can identify, like at the Olympics in 88, I was ahead of world record pace. I should have won the race. I had a bad finish and lost by a hundredth of a second. That's the thickness of your fingernail. And then my next five races were five gold. Yeah, that, that race is famous for teaching everybody about how to finish the, <laughs> the races. And, you know, whenever I'm, when I'm do, when we're doing research, I will, I will that say comes Anthony up a lot. Misty. Yeah. Okay, well. Uh, I will say Anthony Nesty has done amazing things for Suriname. And he's a good guy. Okay. So do I'm you, happy for him. Are you still? And he's, in yeah, and he's now the University of Florida women's coach, right? So, <laughs> so he's still um, out there helping people. So Matt, though, uh, another story that I want would love for our listeners to hear is that your uh, story that we we kind of briefly touched on at the beginning of the show. But I don't want to I don't want to spoil any of the the lead up. Can you tell that story? Sure. I'd been retired for probably uh, 10 years. And my son, who was young, uh, we were camping up on a And, you know, the, the lake is a little cloudy, so you can't always see the bottom, and the wind picks up, and so the waves. And he wanted to swim, but he was just not so comfortable in the lake anymore. So we asked about a pool. So we drove to a local um, public pool in Reno, Nevada. And we walk in and there's a lane rope dividing the shallow end and the deep end. And the shallow end was packed with swimmers all bobbing up and down on the bottom and the deep end was empty. So I had said, Nate, let's go to the deep end. So he comes running out on the pool deck and of course, first whistle, no running on the pool deck. And I raised my hand to the lifeguard and said, I understand. So we set up shop in the corner and he grabbed a kickboard and second whistle, Kickboards are for swim team members only. You cannot <laughs> use a kickboard. And so I waved and we put the kickboard back. So then Nate was probably two, maybe three. And so he was water safe, but it didn't really look water safe. I mean, he would go under and he would be down and sort of, I could tell he was getting air and he could make it to the side to rest. And I'm sitting on the side and now's the third whistle. Sir, if your son's gonna be in the deep end, you have to be in the pool with him. So I waved and my back was hurting, you know, camping, sleeping on the ground. So I grabbed a noodle, a long styrofoam, and I put it underneath my arms and I was in there just resting. And that was it, the lifeguard got up out of her stand. She stood over me, blew her whistle for a fourth time and said, sir, if you can't swim, you have to go to the shallow end. And so I looked up at her and I, you know, Olympic gold medal and the raising of the American flag and the cover of Sports <laughs> Illustrated. And I knew she wouldn't believe me. I left my ID in the car, so I went to the shower. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so funny. Did you, did you really go to the shallow end, Matt? Oh, we had to. <laughs> so we had no choice. Right, because who would have believed? Uh, you no, know, you don't understand. I, I won five gold medals. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that, that is just... One of the greatest stories. I mean, she must have it. she must have never had a, a television in her home or, or a, any kind of a media. Oh, it's funny, you know, even even at the pool where I swim with the master's program, I was in line with my daughter. She was probably five or six to go across this little bouncy blow up thing in the summertime. 
And she waited to get all the way to the front. She was a little scared. So I came up and said I would go with her. And the lifeguard stopped me and said, sir, you can't go. You don't have a bracelet. Hmm. And so then I said, well, how do I get a bracelet? And he said, you have to pass the swimming test. <laughs> and I said, what's the swimming test? And he said, so you have to swim all the way across the pool without stopping or pulling on the lane rope or touching the bottom. <laughs> what was funny is that, that across the pool was the head lifeguard who knew who I was and she just <laughs> had her hand in her head and was shaking it like, oh no. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so Tell I sat across the yeah. pool and got my face I, I, I just yeah. got it. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I'd love to hear about your master swimming experience and what master swimming like has done for you and how, how much you're involved in that type of thing. I swim three days a week with Caneo Valley multi-sport masters. Uh, Nancy Reno is the coach there. Um, she's amazing. Um, group pulling the, the group together. Um, and she knows when I'm slacking off and she's not afraid to, to ride me a little bit when I'm not performing. And I appreciate that. Um, it's just great friendship and of course exercise. I have more patience and I sleep better and it's just an overall really healthy thing. I will say I probably was out of the water for 20 years. I just needed a little break. And yesterday it was 49 degrees and raining and the wind was blowing and I'm standing on the edge of the pool deck in my arena suit wondering what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> so. Well, any, always, you know, you got to stay at it. That's the, any races in your future? I mean, do you mind putting it on the line now? Because a lot of Olympians don't do races as masters because what, you know, what happens? I do not like to compete, I'll be honest. Um, I, I start doing non-events just because I can't, you know, I can't get anywhere close to how I used to perform. Um, but our meet hosts a uh, uh, Matt Biondi meet, uh, the Invitational, that's usually been every March. Of course, we've skipped a few of them. But I, I am obligated to swim in my own meet <laughs> for our club, and I, enjoy, and I enjoy reaching out to the swimmers. And we have uh, quite a few that have come back. I think we're on seven now. Um, so it's been, it's been a good tradition. That's wonderful. I, I want to ask you about your um, introvertus introvertism. <laughs> Have you read the book Quiet? It's about introverts. But anyway, um, it, you know, it's interesting because you seem to really admire the qualities of experts, of, of, of extroverts, excuse me. You know, you, you, you like that person who's well-spoken and who is able to glad hand the other swimmers and, you know, warm everybody up, warm the crowd up. And yet, you know, you clearly enjoy, you know, you're and, and are rebuilt by your time alone. And, um, I, I, I wonder what you think are the qualities that an introvert brings, because of course we need both. What qualities of, you know, of yours that would stem from your intro, being an introvert helps you as a leader and champion? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think the sport has actually helped foster a sense of, you know, contemplation of um, constant analysis uh, reviewing about your strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's the, that's the strength of the introvert is someone who's just very aware of their actions, their effects on other people, how it affects their performance. And, and one of the things that I did really well as an introvert and a young um, developing athlete was I would bank on the things that I did well, but I would not rest on them. So my race was 80% perfect. Well, the 20% then got my attention until it was down to 15. And, that, and I just had the ability to keep focusing until those weaknesses were as minute as they could possibly be. And, and I think that's you know, a competitive spirit, um, someone of a perfectionist, um, someone who can just keep one of my favorite things is, is woodworking and I can just sand forever. I just love that motion and the way it makes the wood feel. And so the introvert, I think, can spend more time with these activities than uh, someone who needs more human contact. Yeah, that's nice. great. Yeah. What else made you so successful, Matt, as, you know, just as a swimmer, how did you, 
what other qualities that you possess made you successful? That's an easy one. And it comes down to two people and they were called mother and father. And so for all the parents out there that are listening, um, my parents provided the opportunity for my brother and sister to engage in healthy activities. My sister was a wonderful pianist and, and an artist, and my, my parents encouraged her in that pursuit. My brother and I were aquatics. We did swimming and water polo. Um, they also provided you know, tennis lessons, and we went downhill skiing, and I, you know, I played the piano and played the drums. Um, but it was always about me. Like my parents were walking behind me, and if I was headed for a pothole and I might skin my knee, they let me fall. And they, we, you know, talk about it. Do you go through the pothole or are you going to go around the pothole? Next time I think I'll go around. And so I knew they were always there, but the motivation was, came from me. I remember I wanted to stop basketball. I was being teased in the locker room. I was so skinny and, and shy. And my parents said, you know, fine, but you can't just come home and be on your phone and watch television or, you know, Apple TV. You got to go out there and engage in something. And so when things got really tough, you know, when you made it to the Olympic final, it was really important for me to know that this was me. I was the one who did this from the ground up. And it gave me the confidence to go out and perform on that very intense stage. One of the most common questions that people ask me, and it's a good one, is what's it like as the whistle blows and you get up on the blocks for the Olympic final? You know, what's going through your head? And what you draw on is the confidence that this is what you want. Nobody else has coerced you or forced you to do this. this is, and so I think it said you that they feel supported, but that it comes from them and not from the helicopter parents or the bubble wrap, shrink wrap parents, which is, you know, some of the trends in parenting today. So you obviously had a ton of confidence to win everything that you did besides that. So you obviously, I, I'm interpreting you as saying, you've got to want it, you know, to, to, when you step up on that block, the whistle blows, you're going for the gold. You've got to want it. But what, what else? I mean, obviously, I, I think, you know, all eight of those people stepping, you know, trying to get number one, they want it. What else gave you that? that unshakable confidence. You know, I, the, Daniel Goldman wrote a book about emotional intelligence. And I think I, my relationship with my mom developed uh, an emotional side of me that allowed me to like sort of outperform what you normally think you could. So the race is tight and you're neck and neck and your, your lungs are burning and your eggs are your legs are aching and you're just, you could be filled with self-doubt, but there was something inside it was able to rely on. And I think a lot of it just had to do with, you know, staying calm and, and believing in yourself um, and just being willing to, to perform. And if my performance isn't good enough, so be it. This is what I have. This is the best that I have today. I set a world record and got second. I mean, that's just, that's all I had for today. It was a great performance, but you just don't always come out on top. Yes, yes. We've, we've uh, heard you talk about... I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, that that's was a great Absolutely. Answer. Yeah, it was beautiful. We've, we've heard you talk about the swimmers, you know, in, in your work with the Swimming Alliance, we've, we've heard you talk about what the swimmers need to do and what their responsibility is in terms of having a more powerful place at the table. Can you expound on that for our listeners and for the swimmers out there? I think the biggest issue right now is transparency about the distribution of funds. And I know that there's been quite a bit written about the uh, top officials in the IOC and also in FINA, um, the, the number of delegates that they have to be able to govern is another question. And to be honest, from the swimmer's perspective, it's just like the good old boys club. 
They, they promote each other, they protect each other, and they control a war chest. They control a, a huge money machine. And um, they'll, they, you know, they have athletes uh, representation on these boards. There's a member or two, but they're largely insiders. There are people who will do and say what um, the party line is. I mean, there's very little um, voice contrary to the, the direction and, and opinions of the administrators. And so I think it comes to the biggest thing is transparency. You know, let us see the decisions and the budgets because we're a part of it. But this amateur culture that we've come from has this uh, structured sort of tier system where you have administrators, you have coaches, and then at the bottom you have swimmers and they shall always stay in their place. And the sport has evolved. I think U.S. Swimming has done an amazing job for postgraduates compared to the experience that I had. There's been growth there, tremendous. Uh, Chuck Wilgus um, um, is passing uh, quite sad in the sense that I think he really developed swimming in our country, um, brought it up to what Australia and, and other federations were doing in, in really encouraging athletes. I mean, I was called grandpa at 26. I was, I had, I had overstayed in the sport for four years. Put me out at 22. And then now we have Dara Torres, five Olympics at 40 for a female. So things have really changed. The, our sport has such potential to move in, in a direction of, of, um, growth and professionalism, as well as maintaining our traditions. And it just, it doesn't seem like the athletes and the management are on the same page. We've heard you, we've heard you talk about the athletes as, you know, being used to sort of being obedient, swimming, you know, just getting in the water, doing what their coaches said, getting out, eating, you know, sleeping, getting, and then, you know, every four years they get the spotlight. And, and it seems like I've, I've also, you know, heard you say that that the athletes need to take responsibility beyond that? And can you elaborate on that? I, you know, I think our sport has developed analogous to gymnastics in the, the level that swimmers, that athletes give up control of their personal lives. So they, this isn't just come to the pool and train. This is what time to get up, what to wear, what to eat, who you can talk to, what you can do on the weekend. And so what I've tried to do as I speak to post graduates, those that have an opportunity to earn a living and to be professionals is to exercise your own right for, for the direction that you want to stand up for what you think. Um, if you feel like your coach speaks for you, that's great. Um, but let, don't be afraid to say what you think and to express your ideas and to look around and be a part of the whole swimming community and not just in lane four, circle swimming. Yes. So Matt, um, what would you, what advice would you give to kind of unfortunately this, this cancellation culture that we've had over the last year, what may happen if the Olympics, you know, don't happen um, but it, everything from listeners who may not be swimmers, they're, they've had their, their wedding postponed or they're not with their friends at school. What, what advice are you giving in these difficult times? I think I, I remember um, the World Championships in 1991 in Perth. They were outdoors and it's probably a reason anymore because the wind had to have been blowing 30 miles an hour on that unsheltered pool deck. And the backstroke flags were bent so much that there was, they held up the meat because the one, you know, only the lanes one and eight had anything resembling <laughs> backstroke flags. And I remember telling my teammates, it's windy for everybody. It's not just windy on you, it's windy for everybody. It's an equal playing field. The trouble here with the, the pandemic is that it seems like it's a socioeconomic uh, countries in that elevated status have access to pools and are able to train and other swimmers have had to leave the country leave their home to go to places where there there are pools to train so I mean 
it's it's difficult and and I think you know it's affected all aspects of our lives um, in reality anybody else I think pales in comparison to your overall health and to, to have all family members at the table when it comes to the next holiday. Um, so we have to keep sports in perspective. Um, but again, you know, these, these unfortunate times, everybody is experiencing them, not just you. Like That's that. great advice. What about your biggest obstacle in your life, you know, prior to the pandemic, if that's, if that's a big obstacle, but just what, what has been your biggest obstacle? Um, you know, I've, I've referenced the experience I had as a, as a postgraduate athlete, um, seeing the, the opportunities in track and field. I mean, Steffi Graf was allowed to be an Olympian in 1988. If she was amateur for two weeks before the Olympics, and she was probably making five to seven million dollars a year. Yet I was over in Bonn, Germany to support my sponsor, Arena, and I would get a fax that said I couldn't swim, and if I did, I'd lose my eligibility in Barcelona. And that was really hard times. And I'll be honest, you know, you think of our Olympic committee as supporting our athletes. I have evidence and can give many stories to account that our, my federation not only didn't support me, but actively suppressed my performance. And that really hurt. Out of 88, there were two swimmers for the United States, Janet Evans and myself, and everybody else pretty much flopped. We were the faces of swimming and they erased me from the record book, so to speak, because I was with Arena and Speedo was the sponsor. It came down to money and that hurt. And that's why I left swimming and went into the classroom for 17 years. So again, that thing about pain and pleasure, that hurt, but the pleasure of it is that I didn't have any concern about leaving the sport. You talk about, I've walked into a room of 1500 people and within 30 seconds, everybody knew that I was there. That feels amazing. I mean, that's that stardom, that faith, that it's hard to turn away. Um, many athletes, you wish they would just retire on top, but they just keep going and go to another team. And, and, and so I was able to walk away and, and not look back. And so that was, that was a silver lining, so to speak. Yeah, that is, that's it's, interesting. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's great. And so then to finish the story, you talk about overcoming. And so yeah. here I am 30 years later, working on behalf of the future of swimming and trying to put in place some of the principles and, and relationships and mutual respect that I didn't enjoy and that I have an opportunity to change that. I, yeah, I love I, that. I, yeah, I was, ju I was just going to say that. Uh, and you, you just summarized it there for me. So we've interviewed a lot of Olympic coaches and many of the top coaches, you know, in the NCAA, but many of our top coaches in the country and Ray Luz, uh, the coach at Indiana put it very succinctly. He said, you'll notice that many of the top coaches have unfinished business. So mm -hmm. some of our, some of the best coaches just missed making an Olympic team or just missed their swimming goals themselves. And so they've, gone back to the pool deck to help others achieve theirs. So I, I was just thinking as you were saying that, that's exactly um, what you're doing now. And it's, it's very exciting to watch. And, and, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I have no doubt you will write that ship that so wronged you. Yeah, I would, I wonder. I is, think, you know, one of the, the things, the, the feedback that I've gotten after my presentations and Ray Luce was, um, one of the coaches that was generous enough to invite me out and, and I was able to speak to his team um, is that the swimmers find me genuine. And I think that I've established a level of trust. And I think it comes from the fact that I really believe in what I'm doing. I mean, this was my personal experience as an athlete. And, and now as a, as a manager of the Swimmers Alliance, I'm able to, to work with the athletes to be able to you know, effect positive change. And I really believe in it. And I think that comes across. It absolutely does. Absolutely. This has been a very powerful interview for the story behind the International Swimmers Alliance. So we will definitely keep 
keep watching that and you and, and know that, you know, that, that program I, I feel is headed for more world records. So uh, Matt, is there anything that we have not asked you that you would like to share with our listeners? Anything related to the ISA or not? Sure. You know, if my oldest son smartphones. And I just, I, as a teacher, I see the effect of the, I've watched the generation. And I think that there's something really lost when we spend so much time, we lack human contact. Instead, we try to substitute for an app that we can download. And it's a powerful tool and I have a smartphone and I need it, it's part of my everyday. But I think it's important for all of us to keep in mind that you know, this social media was intended to develop relationships and to keep people in contact. And I think it's panning out the opposite to create more isolation and anxiety about how wonderful everybody else's life is. I mean, how many Instagram posts are about those pain stories about the swimsuit coming off, right? <laughs> it's many, hard yeah. to find those. It's real life stuff and the phone doesn't give it. So watch out. That's great, great advice from a great champion. So we have one uh, final set of, it's called our speed round. You're the perfect sprinter to do it. It's all fun questions. Are you up for a little, little, little game here, Matt? There, I'm not as quick as I used to be, but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. So this is just a, a one word answer, cat or dog? Dog. Red or blue? Blue. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk. Kickboard or no kickboard? No kickboard. Mountains or beach? Mountains. Oh. Football or baseball? These are easy. <laughs> <laughs> iPhone or Android? iPhone. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Morning person or night owl? Uh, probably now night owl. Used to not be that way, but. <laughs> camping or hotel? Camping. All right, Maria's got a few for you. Okay, these are short answer. What's your favorite color? Green. Mine too. What's your favorite pizza topping? Pepperoni. Favorite vegetable? Um, artichoke. <laughs> favorite get in trouble that's not a vegetable <laughs> no, i think it is i think it it's is. green but, yeah <laughs> favorite swim complex in the u.s i don't know i'll have to look it up i'm curious now uh austin okay uh something well something music. on music some music what's your favorite kind of music classic rock and roll me too tom petty <laughs> oh man uh, yeah. shoe, what's your shoe size? 40. Uh, any siblings? I do. Um, I have an older sister and uh, I lost my younger brother last year. Oh no. Sorry. Oh, that's terrible. So that was, that was a bummer. Yeah. That's uh, okay, favorite Star Wars character? Um, Obi-Wan. And can you cook? <laughs> Someone asked my son that, and you know what he said? We eat out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice answer. Okay, I'm on the barbecue. <laughs> I'll on the, bar. the the last one is what word comes to mind when you dive in the water? Ouch! 
Ouch. <laughs> That's a new one. We got a, that's our. That's a. That's an original. <laughs> I was thinking about this morning when the water was so cold. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt. This has been yeah, such a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, we really, really have enjoyed Good, Maria, it. Okay, thank you. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Same to you. It's now time for the takeaways. Maria, you and I have heard the takeaways are the best part of the show. That's right, Kelly, because the takeaways are curated information, which is what we give to our clients when we coach them. If you would like to take your performance to the next level in health, life, or leadership, go to our website and schedule your free 30-minute consultation. Yes, just click on our coaching page and book there. We're looking forward to bringing out the champion in you. And now, the takeaways. So, Maria, Matt Biondi, the legend. I hope people will listen to the entire show because there was so much great stuff there. Matt is really, he is now pursuing a, a goal and something from his history and his past that I think he is going to bring a special, a special oomph to, a special push. And um, I, there, there's a lot in that interview. Um, what was your first takeaway? Oh, well, I just have to say, I mean, if I had guessed in 1988 that I would actually ever get to interview Matt Biondi, <laughs> I would have said no way. So thank you, Kelly and Matt, for allowing this sort of dream to come true. Because I, you know, I watched him get those medals and I was yeah. excited and what a, you know, and he's, he's an amazing person. So what a great interview. Um, so my first takeaway from it, I, I loved his, I, I don't know that we've ever heard this from a champion you know, you, you kind of pushed him. It's like, you know, everybody wants it. Everybody's competitive. What made you, you know, have that little bit more? And he said, emotional intelligence, which is yeah. a great answer. You know, he said he had a great relationship with his mom. Um, and so he didn't, he, he was able to be calm and, and know that no matter what happened, it was going to be okay. You know, that he was going to do his best. And so that, that just, I guess that's another way of saying maturity but that, that's an interesting concept that if you know who you are and you believe in yourself and you have a good, you know, he said mom and dad were his, you know, the two things that made him successful. I think, yeah. what he, you know, what he's saying is I had a great upbringing. I knew who I was. I was, you know, you know, I had the confidence no matter what happened in the water and that gave me a little bit of an edge. So I thought that was a great answer. And, you know, if you, it, you know, and I think you can, you, you know, you, a, parents out there can remind themselves that, you know, just, just, you know, giving your kids a great upbringing and listening to them and having them express themselves is, you know, is, 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 is probably the most important thing you can do for them better than, you know, getting the best coach or the best team or whatever. So, yeah, I, I thought the, the emotional intelligence answer, really, the way that, that that spoke to me was just that, that at the end of the day, when you stand up to do something that you're scared of, I think that means knowing that if you fail, you're still okay. Yeah. And, and then it gives you an extra like ability to do it. So right. I, I right. love that as, as um, a great takeaway. My first takeaway was, uh, was gonna be, is going to be the, the flip side of the coin. So um, his admiration for extroverts and the fact that, you know, he kind of defined leadership as someone who can put people at ease and, and make people, you know, calm. And, and so I, I really liked that his, my, my takeaway was that you can have, you can be an extrovert and lead people. And you can also be an introvert and have those qualities, which are analysis and comparison and reflection. So, you know, I, I love always, you know, as, as a student of leadership, I love looking at what makes good leaders. When we ask him, you know, what makes a good leader? He said, you know, kind of those were, those were two different qualities. Yeah. How about yeah. your second one, Maria? Yeah, I, I, I love that too. Um, the analysis part, you know, but anyway, okay. The second takeaway for me was something he said about swimmers being somewhat like gymnasts and that they they kind of hand over their lives to their sport and to their coaches and to the system. And he's challenging swimmers. And I think this really applies to every single one of us. And no matter what we're doing, it's, you know, it's easy. It's, 
it's easy in a way to just jump into a system and you know follow all the rules and then you know hope it works out but we each have to take responsibility and that's what he's doing is challenging swimmers to take responsibility for your own lives you know to to ask questions to stand up to you know to to not just necessarily you know do everything that everybody wants you to do and i mean there's i have a, there's lots of examples of this um my daughters are working on a on a project about birth, and there's a, there's a lot of the same kind of um, difficulty around you know having a baby. You go into the hospital and you kind of hand over yourself to the system, and you know we're, we're always allowed to ask questions. We're always allowed to take responsibility for whatever experience we're having. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're like, you know, I'm just doing what everybody says, but I'm not that comfortable, go ahead and and take responsibility for yourself and make your own your own life. And Kelly, you've taught me about this more than anybody. As I always say, you kick doors open and I'm kind of a little rule follower. So um, I, you know, this, this is challenging to me too. Like, don't just follow the rules, you know, look around, take responsibility, create your own life. Yes. I, I hope that, that everyone hears that. And certainly the swimmers that are looking to become professional and change that dynamic. So th I think, I'd love to give my second overall arching theme for the entire interview with Matt and Matt's the trajectory of Matt's life. When we ask him what was his big biggest obstacle, it was not being allowed to be pro, not being right. allowed to even, you know, wear an arena swimsuit and, and not, you know, be able to get any money where other athletes, you know, could de determine or, or be a pro athlete, determine their amateur status two weeks before the Olympics, where swimmers were really under really strict rules and they still have a lot of obstacles. But the, the takeaway is this, that there are things that happen in our lives that seem to be the biggest obstacle and that you never know when later in life, that thing that was so disappointing to you, that truly marked you, becomes the thing that makes you the greatest, becomes the thing that turns you into who you're meant to be. And that is, that is the, the story of Matt's life right now. He is running the International Swimmers Alliance to make a difference in a, taking the disappointment that he had and saying, you know what? That was 30 years ago, but it's never too late. And mm -hmm. in the full interview, which people can hear is, you know, we, we've talked to so many great coaches that said they coach now because they had a disappointing swimming career and they don't want anybody else to have that swimming career. And I know, you know, you and I have done that with our charities, you know, you with uh, losing your sister to brain cancer and then starting a brain cancer charity and me with my, you know, having topical steroid withdrawal syndrome and then starting a charity for that. So it's like, you can take some, you know, something right now in one's life. You might just feel, I cannot believe this happened to me, but you just don't know what is down the road with that. Mm, beautifully said, Kelly. So I hope people get a chance, as I said, to listen to the whole episode. And uh, thanks, Maria, for another great show. Another great show. Love you. Kelly, talk love, to you soon. Love you too. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast with host Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Champions Mojo is produced by Cobra Media, and a new episode debuts every Tuesday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Follow Champions Mojo on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Champions Mojo.